Good morning again, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for, uh, for coming this morning. I see lots of faces who have come from, from, from near and far, and I know it's a uh, slog to get in uh, this time of the morning, too. So thank you again for, for making the trip. And I would be remiss also, uh, as I was in my report, not to uh, more personally thank those of you who participated in the working group series and uh, gave a lot of your personal time to help uh, educate, as I said, a, a liberal arts major about robots, which is no uh, small task. So I see, in particular, Colonel uh, Bill Tart, who's in the audience, uh, thinking about uh, his uh, next career phases and had the opportunity to go to your retirement a couple of months ago and really uh, drew home also everyone in the Air Force who has worked so hard after the, over the past decade and in the other services thinking about unmanned systems. And I, I tapped a lot of you who have that hard-won experience and, and harvested your thoughts and hopefully reflected them in a, uh, in a helpful way. So thank you to, to all of you who contributed. Uh, we are uh, privileged to, to be joined on this panel by three qualified, highly qualified experts to discuss with you what we've framed as the topic of U.S. leadership amid commercial sector growth and changing global supply. The panel opens for discussion a few of the major themes in our report. The first is to consider how relatively important unmanned systems technology and unmanned aerial vehicles, systems, RPAs, whatever we'd like to call them, how important is that technology? Not just the way it's being employed today, but the way that it might be employed going forward, and not just by us, but by other nations and non-state groups as well. Is it transformative or revolutionary, and does it deserve the attention it's receiving? including the proposal that we discussed earlier to elevate it to its own office within the Department of Defense. Is that a, is that a good idea? Is that helpful or is it not helpful? Uh, related, is DOD effectively organized currently to harness the available benefits of unmanned systems? This came up a lot in the panel, but, but going forward, are we going to be able to take full advantage? And I think Dan's question got to the part of it, which is uh, how else might we use them? Where might they be most beneficial? And how is unmanned systems technology, again, being adopted by foreign militaries? What role can and should the U.S. play in shaping a more favorable outcome in this diffusion of military innovation? Stealing a uh, line directly from Mike Horowitz. Uh, what are the arms control considerations? Let me introduce the panel to you in the order in which I will invite them to offer their opening remarks. Uh, depending on time, I might follow up with a, a few hard questions of my own and then turn it over to you all for a Q&A session. Uh, very pleased to be joined by Dr. Lynn Davis, who's a senior political scientist at the RAND Corporation and also serves as RAND's director of the Washington office. From 1993 to 1997, as many of you already know, Dr. Davis served as the Under Secretary of State for Arms Control and International Security Affairs. We are delighted uh, she's here today uh, to discuss, among other things, uh, the findings of RAND's new report, Armed and Dangerous UAVs and U.S. Security, uh, of which she was the lead author. Uh, this is, I will tell you if you haven't read it, uh, the best report I've read on the arms control uh, context and implications of UAVs, and I, I would strongly encourage you to pick it up if you haven't and read it alongside the CSIS report, of course. Great compliment. Uh, and while I'm assigning UAS reading, let me turn to J.J. Gertler. Uh, Mr. Gertler is a specialist in military aviation at the Congressional Research Service with a uh, long and distinguished uh, resume of government uh, and research service before that, including a stint at CSIS, uh, where he was a senior fellow. Uh, and in January 2012, he wrote a report on U.S. unmanned aerial systems, uh, that's a foundational to understanding on the topic and, and was very helpful to us as we conducted our research. And finally, let me thank uh, Mike Horowitz uh, for making the trip down from Philadelphia to join us here today. Dr. Horowitz is an associate professor of political science at the University of Pennsylvania, and he is a non-resident scholar here at CSIS. Uh, in 2012, he served as a Council on Foreign Relations International Affairs Fellow at OSD Policy, where he uh, toiled under people like Ken Handelman in the audience there, uh, and worked on, among other things, UAS export policy issues. And he has just published in the current issue of Foreign Affairs a provocative piece titled The Looming Robotics Gap, and uh, another, another must-read that I will assign coming out of this panel. Uh, and with that, let me turn to Dr. Davis. Uh, for opening remarks. Thank you again. Thank you, uh, thank you Sam, and also for the plug for our recent report. That was, uh, that was kind. 
Um, let me just start by saying I'm going to take you to a slightly different level and pitch uh, for the, the presentation that I'm going to make, but we can come back to some of the more specific issues. I will be talking about um, armed UAVs, uh, RPAs, <laughs> drones, UASs, you know what I'm talking about, so that's, it's, but it, it's the armed systems. And I'm going to just describe to you a couple of the questions that provoked us into the study that we've just, uh, we've just completed, and that is folks were talking about uh, these weapon systems being transformative, uh, talking about these weapon systems proliferating around the world with dangers that one could only imagine. People were talking about having to find arms control solutions, that is to keep that proliferation from happening, and then others were talking about the arms control system, non-proliferation system that's already in effect, the MTCR is standing in the way of all that ever we ever wanted to do in terms of um, kind of developing these systems and selling these systems to, to friends and partners. And so that was sort of the set or the context that led us to want to kind of step back and say, you know, what do we think about those questions and how would we answer those questions? And so in a just a couple of minutes, I'm going to lay out the propositions or findings, and if I don't provoke you along the way to a question or a, a response, um, I'll be a little surprised, but basically I just want to share with you some of the thoughts that, that you know, came to us as we work through uh, some of those questions and issues. And the first uh, sort of, I think, important thing to say about this whole subject is um, that it's really important to distinguish between um, shorter range systems, longer range systems, low technology systems, high technology systems. For this audience, I don't think I need to say that, but I think the debate often is at cross purposes because people don't start by saying, I'm talking about short range systems, or I'm talking about unarmed systems, or I'm talking about long range armed systems. And so I think it's important as we think about how we answer some of these questions to be very, very careful. When we look at how these systems are going to proliferate, there's no question that short-range UAVs are going to proliferate. Um, there are lots of civilian applications. The technologies for those are not that sophisticated. And so we're going to see a proliferation of those kinds of systems. But if you then focus on the longer-range systems and those that are armed, it really kind of reduces the set of countries and places that can develop those and will be likely to acquire those. And I think in addition, what we have to look at is that many of our, our, our partners, but also our adversaries, when looking at these systems, may actually find other systems that are more attractive, either militarily or in terms of cost. And so that sort of sets the boundaries, if you will, of what it means to say that these systems are, are going to proliferate. So then turning from the fact that, yes, they're going to be a round of different kinds and, and different characteristics, um, are these systems transformative? That is, are they revolutionary? Are they game changers? You've, you, I, I didn't know why we were asking that question, quite frankly, when we started. But people said, well, people are out there saying that, and so we better try to answer that question. And so we answered the question by saying, no, it's not transformative in the sense of, nuclear weapons, or even air power as it sort of developed at the end of, um, end of the First World War and on into the Second World War. So we basically, you can find the argument there. So I've actually seen a couple of you know, people shaking their heads, so maybe I'm having um, <clears throat> an effect already in terms of what it is that we're, that we're finding. That's not to say that these systems don't, are not very attractive. That's, you know, trans it's a different sort of question as to how you would find benefits from employing these systems. And there are clearly benefits, and we go through the different types of benefits that one can see, starting with long-range armed um, UAVs. Clearly, they are very attractive to us in the circumstances, that is the United States, in the circumstances that we've been using them against insurgents and insurgents without air defenses. And so they are in a very attractive system for that particular set of operations. And we can, and we sort of move through other places where we could see their attractions. But then we step back and say, but then there's some sort of 
you know, if you will, um, sort of, uh, sort of not, not necessarily things not to make them useful, but they have their own sort of vulnerabilities and limitations. And of course, the the vulnerability of the longer range systems is that they, you know, that air defenses are a counter to those to those systems. Again, I'm not really telling most of you what you don't already know, but I think it's important to kind of set the stage for this for this conversation. Short range, short, short range systems. That's what we were kind of talking about for the most part this morning in the first panel. Are you know have enormous sort of um, opportunities for the for our military services for others. We could see their potential value to terrorists, uh, not only just to have a sort of an effect, a military effect, but maybe a psychological effect. So it is the case that they are, you know, sort of you you have to think of the sort of benefits and limitations of these systems, thinking about the particular missions that they might be um, undertaking. And so before I take up all your time on the panel, um, I'm going to take um, take the point of arms control, something that I've spent a fair amount of time in my life thinking about and uh, non-proliferation. And so, you know, uh, these these are are going to proliferate, but they are not going to kind of create the same dangers that we saw with the proliferation of nuclear weapons or even with missiles, long-range missiles, in terms of the need to think about a regime, you know, in terms of, of, of their non or preventing their Proliferation. I think it's a very different situation with the respect with respect to UAVs, armed UAVs, unarmed UAVs, and I think it's important to see that distinction. In my own mind, these systems are more like conventional aircraft than they are like the other kinds of systems that we have um, sought to uh, design non-proliferation regimes, you know, to prevent the trade or the the, the transfers. Now. Given that's where we are, it's also the case that these systems find themselves already in a non-proliferation regime, in the missile technology control regime. They are already part of that regime, and they they are part of the the controls or the the ways in which we seek to prevent their proliferation. And and so I want to make two sort of final points about about that. And if I haven't provoked you by now, I expect that I will in the next uh, next couple of minutes. One, I see enough flexibility in the MTCR, the Missile Technology Control Regime, for us to be able to share um, and sell these systems to our partners and to our allies. I think the regime itself has that flexibility built into it, and I'm not one to say that somehow we undermine the whole regime by precedence in terms of the potential sale of those systems to our allies and to our friends. But what's good about the MTCR is that it already has in place, you know, a consensus in favor of keeping those systems out of the hands of those that we find dangerous. So we can use that regime to prevent the proliferation of these systems to, to, to potential adversaries and to potential groups that could be dangerous to us. So in a sense, we have the, the ability to, to kind of make the policies that we need with respect to sales while controlling with our, with our allies and those other members of the regime, those that could be dangerous to our security. So let me stop there. Thank you, terrific. JJ. And let me pick up from there in a certain sense. I can't certainly talk about the arms control aspects, but more on the technology side and how widely this stuff is likely to proliferate. Uh, both Dr. Davis's report and Sam's uh, and I'm happy to endorse them both, having spent time at both RAND and CSIS. My sister went to Penn. I can't claim any personal <laughs> experience there. But both of those reports indicate that the technology we're talking about is not all that difficult. The United States has been getting heavier-than-air vehicles to deliver ordnance with some guidance to a remote location since 1917. Active guidance during the course of flight followed not that far afterward. And hobbyists all over the world, every weekend, are flying devices larger than many currently fielded US UAVs, some of which are jet powered, some of which can drop objects. And they're flying them quite some distance from themselves. The technology is out there for the shorter range. And it's not that terribly difficult to scale for longer range. But there's a big asterisk on all of that. 
And it is that while the technology of the air vehicle itself is not that hard, the communications infrastructure for true global operations is reserved to a very few countries. Colonel Callahan could sit in his office somewhere in the Western United States and fly a UAV halfway around the world because we've got a satellite constellation that spans the globe and provides connectivity. Russia can do that. China arguably can do that. And that's the list of countries that can do it. When we're talking about transferring these devices, we're talking about the ones that can be controlled basically line of sight. Some other countries are developing uh, the ability to do communications relay, whether through aircraft or through other UAVs. But that, in some ways, is the more challenging and far less developed technology than unmanned vehicles, remotely piloted vehicles themselves. Is it all coming? It's coming all over the world. There are over 70 countries that are developing one flavor or another of UAV, a smaller subset that intend at least, or have declared an intention to develop armed ones. One of the countries that's maybe not doing quite as much is the United States of America. And I apologize for the small chart, especially to the folks with cameras in the back. The drones are coming, the drones are coming. Well, this is DOD's plan for procuring UAVs through the current FIDUP. We go from over 1,200 a couple of years back to a running level of less than 30 per year. Why is this? It's because the United States is, quite consciously, taking a strategic pause in UAV procurement. Really two reasons. One, for the types of environments we've been operating in for the last 10 years, we've been buying plenty of UAVs that are suited. We have a surplus on hand. We have enough to provide the requirement of 55 full-time caps with a surge to 65. If any of you run across General Dave Deptula in your wanderings, by the way, you can get an earful on just how relevant a metric caps is. But we have that technology already well in hand and fully bought. The next wave of technology, faster, stealthier, there's currently not a procurement plan, at least not one that comes out in the public budget documents, to acquire such UAVs. DOD is consciously waiting until that next generation is ready before they go and start buying more UAVs in order to operate in different kinds of environments than we have been for the last decade. That raises the question, really, of whether DOD is well organized to go ahead and do that. You've seen the moves in Congress. You've seen the proposals to concentrate all UAV procurement, in a, or at least development, in a central joint office. Uh, from the Congressional Research Service perspective, where we don't make recommendations or conclusions, there's some merits to that, and there's some demerits to that. But when you had multiple services buying essentially the same platform, or a couple of platforms from a very limited universe of manufacturers, it's reasonable to ask whether there really need to be separate development organizations doing that, as opposed to those that are developing the requirements and subsequently fielding them. So other countries are going to have UAV capability. They are going to be able to drop things at least within line of sight control on adversaries. How we go about controlling that regime, I'll leave to Dr. Davis, but whether the United States decides to take action to begin defending our forces, and whether that's more a function of something like network attack than physical air defense systems to guard against these, uh, might be a good thing for a joint office to discuss, or at least for think tanks. Thank you, terrific. Mike. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks for having me, uh, Sam. It's an honor to be back here where I uh, first started after college as an intern. Uh, I, I find myself in, in violent agreement with much of what the two previous speakers uh, said, and in the interest of getting to questions, I will, I will try to keep this at least uh, reasonably brief, especially for a professor. Uh, <laughs> I think that it's a mistake in some ways to think about this from a proliferation perspective as just a question of of reaper proliferation to start. And essentially asking the question, will others, how many people will be able to do what the United States can do now? Because I think that 
misses essentially the military robotics forest for the, the CT slash ISR Reaper trees. In that we, we have this current generation of UAVs that we've used to, to great effect around the world and that we're now concerned with others uh, using. But uh, as the, I think the previous speaker mentioned, the, the, the more important uh, issue in some way isn't what we have now, it's what, it's what might happen next. And in that way, I think that the trends from a proliferation perspective are not uh, promising. If you think about the factors that make military technology a lot more likely to spread and spread pretty quickly, two of the most important are whether there are underlying commercial applications for, the, for that technology and what the unit cost of that technology looks like. And in the case of, of most military robotic systems, of which UAVs are a subset, you're talking about a, a technology that, 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 as others have said, is actually pretty simple uh, to build and where the technology is likely to proliferate further. It's not that surprising that, thinking about it that way, that Google purchased, I think, 10 to 12 robotics companies over the last 16 months. And in fact, is taking those that worked in the defense sector and pulling them out of the defense sector. Think about how big the U.S. defense budget is. If, if Google thinks that the U.S. defense budget is, is such small potatoes, that it's worth redeploying their robotics engineers to work on commercial applications, what does that say about what the size of the commercial market is likely to look like and what the spread of this technology is likely to look like? I think what it suggests is that this is a classic example of a type of technology with lots of commercial applications that's likely actually to spread uh, very far. And I think it's also likely to spread very far due to international military investment, international military exports. There was the report that surfaced just a few weeks ago, for example, about uh, Saudi Arabia allegedly purchasing an armed Chinese drone. That, I think, is, is sort of fascinating, and I'll get back to the implications, I think, for U.S. arms export policy uh, in a moment. But I think what that suggests is that the, the proliferation of longer-range armed systems and, and maybe I'll, I'll, I'll try to square the short versus long circle here and say maybe medium, it might happen a little bit faster than we had anticipated. Because it's not just that others will have the ability to build many of these systems because the underlying technology is easier, is pretty easy to get. It's that there are others out there, countries like China and Israel and others, that seem willing, certainly more willing than the United States, to export a lot of these technologies. And, and in a combination of military necessity and, and probably the, the wow factor from US usage over the last decade has generated a lot on the demand side with many countries around the world interested in acquiring advanced UAVs. And for many of them, shorter range armed systems may be enough. I mean, I, I, think, I, I think the whole panel shares the view that the proliferation of those kinds of systems is is inevitable. But I would go a bit further and say that I think that the proliferation of longer range systems may be a little more inevitable than we've realized. Keeping in mind, of course, that the, that the ped tail and all of the processing challenges involved in doing exactly what the US does is something that, that others probably, it'll be very difficult for, for many people to do. But that doesn't mean that especially as this technology gets cheaper and proliferates further, that others won't have longer range systems able to do more and able to do things that are militarily uh, relevant. And that's why I think it's important for the United States to do uh, two things. Uh, one is I think that the, as the last panel uh, hinted at, the ongoing debate about the capabilities that the new U-class system will have, I, I think in some ways is the, the canary in the coal mine for exactly that, that chart the hesitation that the, the United States military has demonstrated when it comes to investing in next generation military robotics, especially military robotics that get out of the COIN, CT, ISR kind of box. And those are the technologies, of course, that are the most challenging to existing constituencies, interest groups in the, serv in the services. Those are the ones where we would therefore expect there to be uh, a lot more resistance. 
And so I think continuing to push the envelope on those technologies, especially in an era of fiscal austerity, will be difficult, but something that the United States needs uh, to do. And the second thing I, is that I think the United States actually needs to lean a little bit further forward when it comes to our UAV export policy. And I think that the United States should do this, of course, within the confines of the NTCR in a way that doesn't abrogate America's arms control commitments. But in an age of fiscal austerity, building partner capacity to substitute or supplement for American capabilities is an important national security priority. And there's a strong demand signal from America's allies and partners. This is a technology that, that many are interested in, including some of our closest allies around the world. And I think it's possible for the United States to design a responsible export policy to close, you know, that involves allowing more armed systems out the door to our closest allies and partners. But the alternative here is not that if we don't do this, they won't get these systems. We like to think that sometimes these are unique and special snowflake. But given that we know that the U.S. monopoly on, on armed UAVs is, is over, if it ever existed, the alternative is not that if we don't sell armed UAVs, others won't get them. The alternative is either that they'll be incentivized to build them themselves, to invest more in those sorts of development capabilities, or that they'll simply buy them from others. And I think in a world, especially when it comes to the present generation of UAVs, where we're interested in promoting responsible usage of this technology in a safe way that, that complies with, with the you know, law of war, international law, et cetera, we have a much better chance of encouraging that with responsible exports than by you know, t you know, throwing our hands up and saying, we don't want to play this game and letting countries buy systems from China or design them themselves instead and not getting access to the training and other things that will, will allow the U.S. to shape the way that the rest of the world uses these systems. All right, and I'll stop there. Thank you very much. A, a lot to, to chew on. And before I turn it over to you, let me uh, ask Dr. Davis to follow up on a point that, that Mike raised. So if we assume that the proliferation or the spread of these systems is, is somewhat inevitable, at least in, in terms of shorter range armed systems, uh, what are your thoughts about uh, how the U.S. has an ability to set the standard on how they might be used, or, or do we have an ability? Uh, will, how, how are other states likely to use them? Will they look to use them in the ways that we do? Should we expect uh, surprises? And, uh, and then uh, after, after your thoughts on that, JJ, maybe if you could pick up the, the question of, of defense uh, if these are spreading rapidly, have we done enough to think about our vulnerabilities in, in that uh, environment? Sorry. I'm going to go back again to say, and I think we tried to keep the distinctions between short, fuzzed over a little bit to, to longer range, but I think when we think about arms sales and export controls, we really do need to think about the distinctions. And also when we think about sales to to partners, allies, uh, the distinction as well. I, as I thought I sort of began to suggest, is that you know sales of these, particularly the shorter range systems, maybe even over into the longer range systems, ought to be, in my mind, thought of more like conventional aircraft than it is like other kinds of non-proliferation types of sales. And if you do that, then you're thinking about those in the same ways you think about you know, a sale of an aircraft to, to a partner, and is that the best use of their money? Is it the best use of our sort of uh, sales to them if we want to think about building partnerships or interoperability and all those, all those different kinds of things? So if you have, I think that sort of, if that's on your mind as you think about this, then I think you have a way, not in necessarily, you know, simple way, but a way through the issues having to do with export controls and and transfers, and that's the way I think the debate ought to be, to be structured. As we think about arms sales, of course, the argument is made that we would potentially have more control, like you say, over the use of those if we are actually the, the folks selling them rather than they're developing them on their own or they're coming from Chinese, the Chinese or whomever. And here, the, the last part of our report really does talk about 
how we ought to see the, uh, own, our own use of uh, these systems um, as a sort of motto for their potential use to others, which takes the additional step beyond how we might be able to sensitize our allies and, and friends as to their use if we're in the arms sales business, but then beyond that to how our own use. And we, we talk about the different ways or the different foundations that you might set for our own use over time so that others would use them um, following along those same sorts of principles. And I, mean, I think that's um, a discussion that started by the, the way the, the administration has started to talk about its own use, um, sort of, you know, post-Afghanistan, now in a world in which, you know, terrorism is more, you know, more, more global, um, but still with the value of these systems to that particular set of missions and contingencies. And so as we, um, as we try to think through our own use and how we place it in the larger environment to start thinking about you know, whether there are ways in which the U.S. can take a leadership role in establishing international norms for the use of these longer range systems, armed systems, and whether or not there are ways that we can gain a consensus among those who would be operating those into the future. Thanks. Thank you. With regard to defenses, uh, United States forces don't tend to like anything flying over their heads that isn't ours. And fortunately, we've operated in a lot of environments uh, in the last 50 years where there hasn't been anything flying over our heads that wasn't ours. And we are optimized to defend against many types. Take the whether it's an inhabited vehicle out of the question. If it flies at a certain altitude at a certain speed, we know how to shoot it down. What is unusual about the UAV challenge in air defense is, first, you have some that are very small and fly very low in an area that we haven't traditionally optimized our defenses for. But second, you also have some other tools that are applicable. Electronic warfare becomes a much more relevant tool if you're trying to disrupt an unmanned vehicle. Network attack becomes a much more relevant tool if you're trying to dis uh, disrupt an unmanned vehicle. So there are opportunities av available to us. One of the reasons, in fact, this may be a decent argument for that joint organization is because the threat to each of the services is different from UAS. But some of the tech underlying technologies that you would use in addressing that threat are very common. Whether that would come out of a UAS office, whether it would be charged with defense as well as offense, uh, is a separate question. But when you start looking at things like EW and network attack, you're looking at basic technologies and then refining the application service by service rather than having to develop the technologies in parallel. Of course, our adversaries have those same opportunities against our systems as well. So you're in no this question. sort of classic way of doing it. And then we get to the question of should we export that? Mike, did you want to jump in? I've, I've got another one for you if, if, if you, if you, okay, great. <laughs> the, uh, the question for you is based on your research on uh, historical uh, diffusion of military innovation and, and watching how uh, militaries do and do not successfully uh, integrate new, new technologies, um, what uh, is your assessment of how DOD is doing with this technology? How, how's, it, how's it going? <laughs> and in light of uh, sort of next wave technologies we anticipate to be intersecting like autonomy, uh, what, what, what are the keys to uh, maintaining our edge? That's a great question, and, and in some ways, I think it gets back to the, the great point that the issue for each service is somewhat different, the, the, the challenges presented by unmanned systems and, and even unmanned aerial systems uh, or vehicles are, are somewhat different. The, you know, what we, all, we all know what we don't want. We, we don't want the U.S. to, to end up you know, in the way in the sort of stylized military history fact, sort of like the British with the aircraft carrier, where they... They're the inventor of the technology and even have some systems that work pretty well, but essentially don't figure out the force employment. They, they think about it more as a spotter for the battleship rather than as the, the mobile airfield that we've come to think of the carrier as. And in, you know, in some ways, the, you know, to, to throw a little sci-fi uh, out there, hopefully you know, sci-fi, the, the worst case for, for a country like the U.S. is imagine a, you know, a future contingency in, in, a, you know, in a place like East Asia where 
the United States, US, the US is fighting against another country's Air Force, say, to use the Air Force as an example, and we toss up uh, F, you know, fifth generation aircraft, uh, F-22s and F-35s, and they shoot down our adversary systems at a ratio of, say, eight to one or 10 to one. But suppose our adversary is deploying unmanned systems that they build at a cost differential of 15 to 20 to one. That's a cost curve that the United States would be on the wrong side of. And despite having what would still be the best pound for pound aircraft in that case in the world, that would be a conflict that I would be extremely nervous about. And that's the outcome that I think a lot of people, you know, I think in, in, in this room and who think about these issues seek to uh, avoid. In that, I think that the DOD, the Department of Defense has done reasonably well up to this point in investing in some of these technologies. But the big challenge moving forward is gonna be integration. And I mean integration in two arenas. I think the first is it's, it's no doubt, and in some ways I think the comment on the previous panel that, that you know, you take you know, our kids sitting on a couch and their quick twitch reflexes and computer skills over anybody else in the world, point well taken. The, the challenge is taking the technologies that are being invented and moving them into the services, making them regularized parts of how the services operate. And I think that's both true for unique military capabilities for platforms the services develop, and I think it's especially true for the integration of commercial advances. Think about how long it takes us to build anything. I think that developing faster ways to integrate commercial robotics especially as that market explodes over the next several years, will be crucial to sustaining America's edge. Yeah, and I should say, following up on both the, the defense point and on the exports point, we have a lot of experience and understanding of air systems. We haven't been talking nearly as much, either here today or in the community as a whole, about underwater vehicles and land vehicles. What are the potential controls on those? What is the desirability of controlling those? What is the United States interest in defending against those? My perception, not being an expert in that field, is that the international development of those systems lags behind us even more significantly than in the air. But it might be, some, uh, since the subject is unmanned systems and not just aerial, we might want to give some thought to those. Great, and let me uh, open it up to audience questions, and I will uh, take two of them at a time. This is a great innovation, because then we can pick which ones we want. Jake Carney might start doing this, too. <laughs> so, Sir, in the front, and if you wouldn't mind just waiting for the mic, Sam's bringing it to you, and identifying yourself. Sure. Hi, I'm uh, Richard Whittle. I'm an author and a fellow at the National Air and Space Museum. Um, and I'm wondering, especially based on Dr. Horwitz's uh, last remarks, uh, going forward, is, is part of the reason the uh, Defense Department is investing less uh, in uh, UAS uh, that it's investing so much in the F-35? The F-35 is supposedly the last manned strike fighter, and the uh, U-Class, I guess, is the first unmanned strike fighter. So are those two programs complementary or competitive? Great question. And we can take one more if anybody has one. Sir. Uh, Bill Greenwald, American Enterprise Institute. Uh, I wanted to follow up on the commercial side, and, and uh, obviously there is a lot of investment, a lot of interest uh, going on. At what point, you know, and obviously we still have the FAA to figure out how we're actually going to employ these things, and that could take a, a, few, uh, a few years to say the least. But at what point does uh, the MTCR become a barrier to the deployment of, say, unmanned cargo aircraft? It seems there's going to be a range and a, uh, a, ca a capacity that's going to inhibit not only cargo aircraft, but possibly uh, some of the things that Google was thinking about uh, in uh, networking. Thanks. Who would like to uh, start? It might even keep Amazon from delivering my stereo. No. We'll, we'll have the tenured professor take the F-35 question. Sure. The, I, think the, I think the F-35 in, in U-Class should be complementary rather than, than competitive. Uh, I'm not sure if it's necessarily going to end up that way if you think about you know, service cultures and the potential for, for people to think that there's sort of competition between them. And this gets to whether the U-Class will look you know, more like a reaper on a boat 
or more like a you know, more advanced you know, sort of next generation system. But I think that we, we tend to, I mean, there, I think there are basically three different ways that we can imagine the integration of unmanned systems, and, and I think this is true both in the air and, air and beyond. The first is the way that we've often been thinking about them, which is essentially one-to-one -one substitutes. You know, either you'd have an F-35 or you'd have a U-class. But the second, and I mean, Boeing demonstrated last summer some of the possibilities here through the remote piloting of an F-18, is essentially man-on-man -man teaming. The possibility for, say, uh, an F-35 up in the air with a bunch of unmanned fourth generation systems working together. And then the third is, is of course, the, you know, swarm, which means something we know it's important, but we're not sure exactly, um, uh, exactly what it means. And I'll, I'll leave the uh, MTCR question to the, the arms control expert. JJ, did you want to add in first on the first question, and then we'll go over to Dr. Davis here? Um, only two things. One is, in a competitive, in, in a limited budget environment such as we have today, every program is competitive with every other program. I haven't seen signs that DOD is consciously trading off F-35 against uh, unmanned vehicles or the other way around. But it, you're trying to fit all of these programs through the same soda straw. So naturally, there is some competition. Um, and the other, oh, the other part was re regarding the notion of controlling other UAVs. Uh, those of us who've been around a little while remember when the Army Comanche was going to be the quarterback of the digital battlefield. <laughs> if you conceive of an F-35 controlling four UAVs in concert, those loyal wingmen we heard about in the first panel, isn't that the real definition of the quarterback <laughs> of the digital battlefield? So, uh... I think you were, were you discussing our own development or the potential transfers of systems? I would say, I would say the incentive to do such, in other words, if MTCR is, is a barrier, is there any incentive for any commercial company to even think about going to that point? So it, 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 is that a barrier? I mean, under current structure on MTCR, I believe the payload and the, and the frame would be glued to do something like that. Well, and how, and how could, uh, how, uh, So let me come back and say it's really important to, and we try to do this in the paper, and for those of you who really want to get into details, I, that's what we were, we were trying to do. Because you're right to say it really does depend on both the range and the, you know, the capability of the system to deliver a payload. So you have to start there and you have to see whether it falls within those parameters or not. Uh, in order to get to the MTCR kind of categories, you're not talking about line of sight kinds of uh, vehicles, you're really talking about these more sophisticated, higher technology vehicles. So the ones that Amazon may be deploying or the ones that they're deploying over movie sets and all that are probably not going to fall within <clears throat> the categories of those. But notwithstanding that, the regime itself is an export control regime. It's not like a treaty that, that bans weapon systems, like on the nuclear side. So it's an export control regime in which each nation has its, you know, keeps its own prerogatives to sell and transfer. And in my view, there's technology, you know, there's flexibility within that system to make those kinds of transfer sales, you know, as they, if, if they seem sort of warranted in our national security interest. And so I think this whole idea that MTCR is a block is really not the way to think about the regime. B bottom line. Great. Next question. Patrick Tucker. <laughs> Thanks for the call out. Yeah, Patrick Tucker, Defense One. Um, so, to me, it seems like the cost effectiveness of these machines goes up as autonomy is introduced. And there are a lot of things to talk about in terms of in increasing autonomy. There's ethical considerations, there's clear cost considerations. Anyone in AI will tell you there's technical considerations that's really hard to do and it might be years away. Having said that, that's where you're going to perhaps realize the greatest amount of um, bang for the buck in the future development of these systems. So I was wondering if you would address uh, briefly, what should we think about when we talk about spending more to increase the autonomy of armed UAVs? What are we missing and what should we be focusing on? Thanks. Why don't we just take that one because I have a feeling that's going to inspire some spirited response. Who would like to take it first? Mike? I'm not going to say no to talking. The 
I think how the United States deals with the autonomy question writ large, and I, I'd push that beyond UAVs, is an uh, enormous question. Uh, and I, I'd say, I say beyond UAVs very explicitly because I think the, the underwater realm is, wo is one that potentially, particularly ripe for the use of autonomous systems. But I think it's important to distinguish between automation and autonomous weapons. And that automation means automating, automating more and more tasks. Say, if a UAV loses satellite connectivity, what is it programmed to do? Whereas autonomous weapons is, you know, we all start getting worried about the Terminator on the, on the battlefield. The, I think, you know, as the, as the DOD directive on autonomy states, the United States, I think, you know, is not, uh, is not deploying any autonomous weapons uh, right now. I think the, the United States will probably uh, go slow on these systems pretty deliberately, precisely because they raise these very complicated uh, ethical and uh, technical uh, challenges. And that very simple autonomy, if you think about something like the Israeli harpy, uh, isn't uh, all that hard to do. It's building an autonomous system that can strike a target precisely with the level of confidence as an even an unmanned system that, that I think is extremely, uh, is, is extremely difficult. But I think there are reasons to, to imagine that lots of countries around the world may be interested in this and that one could imagine, for example, autonomy as a potential, potentially attractive place to go for countries concerned about, about uh, anti-access area denial environments, about A2AD. And what do you do in general in a world where you think you might have to continue fighting even though you've lost connectivity? So I, I think this is going to be, a, I think this is the, the, the bleeding edge of where we need to be thinking. I think it's important as we, this is another distinction that, that I think it's important to, to remember, and that is, you know, when you're talking about um, autonomous systems, we have some of those, a cruise missile, right? <laughs> so we have some, you know, that go on a one-way mission and just go, and then there's those that go and then come back. And so, and the, the going and coming back is what's very difficult. If you just take a, something that's not very high technology, you want to crash it into something, and surprise somebody or, you know, have sort of psychological effect, those things, you know, Hezbollah's used something like that, you know, against the Israelis. So I think it's, again, to make, you're not talking about that, I know, but just, again, for purposes of clarity, what it is that you're actually meaning. Okay. Sir, right here, in just one moment, Sam, will bring your mic here. Jim Katke with National Defense University. Uh, following up on this uh, a fully autonomous uh, theme here, one of the things I find most interesting in this whole area in the private sector is the uh, do-it-yourself community. So you're having you know, these communities now, people sharing plans for different things. They're 3D printing them. They're sharing control systems. It's very rapidly evolving. Uh, I wonder if I could get your thoughts on potential threat spectrum going ahead from non-state actors using these types of systems, <coughs> terrorists or even lone wolf terrorists. And let's take uh, one more right in the front, sir. Evan Wallach from uh, GW Law School. Uh, I teach a course in this stuff. Uh, let me ask Dr. Davis, would you consider it transformative in your area uh, if you looked at these things from the viewpoint of command responsibility, that is, eliminating the fog of war and the ability to go in afterwards when you investigate and determine exactly what the device did and how it was directed to do it. Would you like to start with the response to that? Uh, we're looking at the, this is a you know, kind of a first defense, which is that we weren't looking at the specifics, but more that general sense of, you know, is it like the weapons that we've we called to be transformative in the past, and is it a useful thing to talk about these systems as transformative or more like the norm, you know, kind of weapon systems that you understand and we've dealt with before, <clears throat> and therefore, having done that, we can sort of apply the ways we've done that before to, to these systems. And so, I, I, I can I can say we didn't address that specifically. Um, I'm I'm thinking that you think it is by asking the question. And if so, then give him back the microphone for a second and let him tell me why. 
Well, I, I don't need a mic. I was a drill sergeant. <laughs> <laughs> if, if you don't mind. Okay. Sure. Um, the former Yugoslavia tribunal uh, worked on imposing uh, command responsibility on civilian leadership uh, because uh, they said, well, you had the ability to control and investigate. Now, supposing uh, when Mi Lai takes place that uh, Lieutenant Kelly can be downloaded and uh, Coster and President Johnson and everybody in between can determine exactly what was done. Under the treaties, certainly under the protocols, they have an obligation, a criminal obligation, to then investigate and punish. And if they don't do it, it's a war crime. That's what I'm thinking. But then I'm not an expert, but my colleagues are, as to whether that's any different than from some of the other systems we have as well. well my interest is eliminating the fog of war, though that you can't say we didn't. Until we get to a regime that, where autonomous vehicles are being employed, where they are making their own judgments and revising their actions based on the circumstances around them, somebody programmed, somebody steered it to a particular place, somebody told it, go here, do this. That is one of the really confounding things, getting back to the autonomy question, about mm -hmm. when you start to give devices uh, the ability to change their own orders on the fly based on the combat environment they find themselves in. Yes, presumably you could still go and download it, but somebody along the way programmed the logic that makes the machine do what it does. So there, it is always traceable back somewhere. How far back you start to get into legal questions that are beyond certainly my competence, and I suspect those of most of the people in the room, except perhaps yourself, sir. And who would like to take the DIY community slash non-state actor question, the threat question? Only that we've already seen it. Um, there was the gentleman arrested for planning to fly a UAV into the Pentagon, I believe. That's exactly the example I would say. The other, so. the other side, too, is that if you think, think about the different ways that terrorists could employ or, or gain either military effect or psychological effect, there are a whole lot of other ways that they would find easier and, and potentially more effective than this one. So you're actually, th I think, in one, and we write through that so you can go find that as well. I think it's just important as we think about each of these uses to think about the alternatives that exist to the use in this particular way. And we've got time for one last question, if somebody has one, and they can keep it short. Hi, um, Major Ryan Sims, Headquarters Air Force. My question is uh, regarding uh, the, um, the MTCR again. Uh, in the past, we've seen a similar scenario occur with the development of satellite technology with regards to the U.S. controlling export, um, imp imposing, you know, those types of prohibitions. And then it inherently drives a side industry of uh, other countries like the French, for instance, who, who sort of take pride in the fact that they can develop an ITAR compliant satellite and sell it to other countries. And so thereby, um, I'm wondering if you are seeing any parallels with regard to this technology, the, um, the proliferation of UAS technology across other countries that are taking interest in it, um, the United States imposing strict regulations and then thereby inherently creating a side market which we no longer can control or have any oversight of? Great question. Mike. I think the, the potential analogy between unmanned systems and, and the satellite industry is, is potentially harrowing from an American perspective. No analogy is ever perfect, but and in some ways this gets back to the previous question about uh, cargo aircraft in, in some ways, and that if the United States makes the decision to take itself out of the market, that doesn't mean that the demand won't exist. And we can be comforted by the fact that right now we're ahead, but we're, that market will exist. and. Other countries will work on the technology to fill that vacuum, and the profit motive is very strong, and so other countries' technologies will get significantly better, which in some ways I think is why it's important for the United States to, to lean forward a little bit when it comes to unmanned exports right now to lock in our advantage and, 
and in some ways discourage some, some other actors from maybe even getting into the game in the first place, because we know from the satellite case that if we step back, others are going to get involved and their technology will end up being pretty darn good. And we know that from the UAS case as well. I mean, while the United States has exported to Britain, Italy, looks like France, and is considering Japan, Germany bought Israeli. The Russians bought Israeli. Uh, and the Chinese are evidently willing to sell to just about anyone who wants. So the market's out there already for the non-US systems. Uh, Saudi and UAE allegedly have bought Chinese. Final word. <laughs> Final word. Uh, I think the ASAT is different in the sense of where it falls in terms of regimes and how you would think about arms control or nonproliferation. So I think that's why it's not analogous. You are making it analogous, as my colleagues are, as to how it is that if we don't sell, others will, will take the market. That's a debate that goes well beyond <clears throat> either space or well beyond UAVs, but to conventional aircraft. And the debates we have about what kinds of sales we make on conventional aircraft, what kinds of technologies we associate with those, who will be in that market if we're not in that market. You know, we have a lot of experience about that. We have a lot of processes that go in place to try to make those decisions. Um, I've sat there with a pen at times making those decisions. They're not easy decisions, but I think that's the route that we should be taking with these systems and thinking about it sort of individually and in that context. Thank you very much, and thank you. You've been a, a great audience. Thank you for the mini-conference uh, experiment we've done here, two panels back-to-back. -back. Uh, and please join me in thanking the panel.